Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm just going to be briefly introducing the uh, roles and what I'll be moderating tonight. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Hilltop Restaurant for another illustrious round of exuberant and excessive verbiage. So let's get started with this uh, playfulness of uh, the oratorical, or maybe some of us would think excessive and effluent verbiage. <laughs> there are some basic rules to the college, uh, which basically means one fool at a time, and we don't insult others with personal attacks. Or their mothers. Or their mothers. Now, the college is consisted in a format of where we have a brief announcements period, then we have a, the speaker speaks, we have a question and answer period, and then after that we have our infamous rebuttal period. Thank you, uh, David. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, without any further ado, then we will hear from our uh, speaker about the philosophy of May Day. complexes is one of the great traditions of Chicago um, and speaking of Chicago you know I was reminded this week uh, why I hate this city <laughs> it's like I was walking down Argyle Street and uh, I saw a police officer harassing a bunch of homeless people and he was shooing them you know down the street and a young woman a young African-American woman um, was very hurt, obviously, um, to be talked to like like he was doing. And, uh, you know, I said, what what did he tell you? And she said, well, he told me, you know, go down to Wilson Street by your own kind. You know, we, we don't want you here. Uh, and I said, well, what did he say you were doing? And she said, well, he said we, can, we can't stand on the sidewalk. And I said, well, of course you can stand on the sidewalk. The city's actually full of people standing on the sidewalk at this very moment. And as I was saying that, the cop comes running up and he says, She doesn't need any legal advice from you! <laughs> and so I said, well, I wasn't actually giving her legal advice, but I was, you know, telling her uh, what her rights were. And if you consider that something that's a problem, then you consider that a problem. And so we had a back and forth, you know, um, until he decided, you know, that he wasn't going to arrest us, which he had thought about uh, at the beginning of the thing. Um, and I thought, this is Chicago, you know? This is like my experience of the city, what it's been. Um, I think this is a lot of people's experience of the city. It's mean police officers, it's, you know, growing up on the south side with only one party to vote for, the Democratic machine. Uh, it's, the, it's the growth of more and more cutbacks over the years, cuts in schools, cuts in mental health care, cuts in everything. Um, and you know, sometimes it's an effort, but it also makes made me want to change things. And wanting to change things, you you go you decide there's a different history that's possible, and you learn about another history in Chicago. Um, you learn about the revolutionary center that Chicago has been uh, through the years. Um, Things like the founding of the Industrial Workers of the World that happened here. Um, things like the founding of the early Communist Party and the African Blood Brotherhood and the anti-racism that was happening. Um, things like the founder of Marxist humanism, Raya who grew up, who was over on um, Roosevelt Road when she discovered Marxism. Um, 
you know, things like, that I remember from my youth, although they were kind of demonized, but in retrospect, they were wonderful things like the Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party, uh, the newspaper whose T-shirt I sometimes wear, Rising Up Angry, um, which was a, you know, something directed toward people like, like from my own background. Um, but before all of these things, before all of these revolutionary things, Chicago was the home of the birth of May Day as the international workers holiday. And it's something that um, is fascinating. It was very moving. I don't know if, if anyone else was at the May Day demonstration the other day, but uh, you know, it was largely made up of uh, immigrant workers. Uh, mainly from Latin America, also from Asia, but, but mainly from Latin America. And many of the Mexican workers were th who were there, um, they would have known May Day from, you know, growing up in Mexico as what was called the Day of the Chicago Martyrs. And I was, I'm very moved by that fact, that, it's, that immigrant labor has, you know, brought back to us in Chicago this tradition that was largely forgotten here for many years, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, I'm thinking that probably since there's a, this is an annual, I mean, annually there's somebody talking about May Day, people kind of know the general history of the, of the Haymarket affair and the martyrs. No. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go into it in a little bit. Um, it was actually... Uh, the struggle for the eight-hour day that was taking place, and in 1886 there was a huge May Day demonstration uh, in favor of that. Uh, with a number of unions, it was the AFL, the Knights of Labor, um, the Socialist Labor Party of the time, uh, the Anarchist Federation, they all came, came together and had this huge demonstration. Um, and a general strike was happening in Chicago. Um, and what happened on um, May 3rd was there was the killing of a number of striking workers at the McCormick Reaper Works in Chicago. Uh, six workers were killed by, by, by uh, thugs and police. And then on May 4th, there was a meeting at Haymarket Square, a protest meeting of this, um, with all of the labor movement people. Towards the end of the meeting, there were about 200 people still left towards the end of the day. And uh, police came, a huge number of police, like 100 police showed up to, to try to chase them away. Uh, somebody threw a bomb into the police. Uh, seven of them were killed. Actually, one of them was killed instantly. Six of them died later. Um, a number of workers then were killed in revenge by the police. Nobody really knows how many. Uh, there wasn't a, there wasn't a count. There was never an accounting for it, actually. Um, and I just, I just, I had not seen before, but as, uh, Art Young, the labor cartoonist, uh, at the time, he was a young reporter, and he reported on this, and I just, I wanted to read, you know, what he had written at the time, because it's, I, I found it very interesting. Uh, he said, this is later on in his memoirs. He said, I need not dwell at length about what happened at Haymarket Square on the night of May 4, 1886, three days after the nationwide strikes for the eight-hour day. The story has been told many times. The mass meeting of some 1,500 persons in protest of the wanton killing of workers by police. Mayor Carter Harrison in attendance. Albert Parsons speaking, then leaving with his wife for a beer garden a couple of blocks away. This is a very beautiful picture of Chicago at the time, too. Um, Samuel Fielden, mounting the wagon used as a rostrum, rain beginning to fall and the crowd dwindling. The mayor departing and visiting the nearby Desplaines Street police station to report to Captain John Bonfield, disregard, disregarding the mayor's words and in a few minutes leading 125 reserve policemen to the scene and ordering the remaining audience of some 200 persons to disperse. Then from above or behind the wagon, a whizzing spark, a tremendous explosion, many policemen falling, their comrades firing into the panic-stricken crowd, 
killing and wounding. Seven of the police died. How many civilians were killed by police bullets that night was never definitely known, and nothing was ever done about it. And then Young visited uh, the jail where they were held and described uh, the, the uh, people who were framed for, this, for the Haymarket bombing. Albert Parsons sat writing at a table piled with books and papers. He reminded me of a country editor, and he had edited a paper in Waco, Texas, before he came to Chicago. Adolf Fischer, who had been a printer on the German workers' paper, the Arbeiter Zeitung, looked like an eagle, light-haired, eager, and appearing as hopeful as he had been in court. George Engel, also a German printer, had less the appearance of an intellectual than the others. His eyes seemed dull, as if feeling had gone from him. Michael Schwab, spectacled associate editor and editorial writer, had a sad face. Samuel Fielden, a bearded ex-Methodist preacher born in England, was a familiar speaker in halls and working class street meetings with the voice and right intensity of a born orator. It's coming. August Spies, editor of the Arbeiter Zeitung, was strikingly handsome, straightforward in his talk. But it is Lewis Ling that I remember best in thinking back to that visit to the jail. My memory picture of him is clearest because the sun was shining in his cell as I sketched him. Only 22 and blonde, he had a look of disdain for all. He sat proudly in his chair, facing me with unblinking eyes, silent as though he might have been saying, go ahead, do what your masters want you to do. As for me, nothing matters. They were all young men, except Fielden, who appeared to be in his 40s. Even the beard worn by Schwab and Ling's mustache could not describe their youthfulness. And now word came of an explosion in the jail, that Louis Ling had put a bomb in his mouth and lighted the fuse and was dying. I was chilled with the horror of the story as details kept coming in, suffering untold agony with his face terribly mutilated. Ling remained conscious while three physicians worked over him and lived for six more hours. In response to appeals, the governor issued a formal statement commuting the sentences of Fielden and Schwab to life imprisonment, but refusing to interfere with the sentences against the other four who were executed. Um, the, uh, this was all ultimately determined to be a frame up and a pardon by uh, Governor Altgeld, who the street is named after, came down uh, very courageously. Um, but this is why, you know, the day became known in Latin America as the day of the Chicago martyrs. Um, because these were, you know, these men were heroes of the labor movement. Uh, and they died. And what did they die fighting for? They died fighting for uh, an eight-hour day for working men and for freedom beyond that. And it's the freedom that's at the root of that um, that I think is what is the philosophy of May Day. That's why I, you know, I wanted to talk about the history of philosophy as well. Um, so just to recall the basics of where the struggle for the eight-hour day immediately arose from, um, it, it arose, first of all, from the Civil War abolition of, of slavery. Um, and I want to quote, again, I want to quote from Marx, from Capital, because Really, this book is the philosophy of May Day. Um, and it's amazing to what extent it's the philosophy of May Day. Um, but Marx wrote in 1867, in the United States, every independent workers' movement was paralyzed as long as slavery disfigured a part of the republic. Labor in a white skin cannot emancipate itself where it is branded in a black skin. However, a new life immediately arose from the death of slavery. The first fruit of the American Civil War was the eight hours agitation, which ran from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from New England to California, with the seven league boots of the locomotive. The General Congress of Labor held at Baltimore in August 1866 declared, the first and great necessity of the present to free the labor of this country from capitalistic slavery is the passing of a law by which eight hours shall be the normal working day in all states of the American Union. 
We are resolved to put forth all our strength until this glorious result is attained. And this question of an eight-hour day, I mean, today, you know, people kind of almost, you know, well, for years people almost took it for granted. Now we're getting back to, like, the 10-hour day and the 12-hour day. But, um, you know, it was by no means taken for granted then. I mean, children would work 10 or 12 hours in jobs that were dangerous, in jobs in mining, um, things like that, in factories. Um, they would die. And there would be nothing, no, no redress at all. So from this declaration for the eight-hour day, there came a growing labor movement. Um, there, in 1877, there was a huge strike wave. Uh, the first general strike in the U.S. took place in St. Louis. There were pitched battles between workers and police in a number of cities. Um, Marx at this time was also following was following all of this, but also was taking the high points of the labor struggles at the time and writing them into a philosophy of of history based upon the struggle for freedom by the lowest, most exploited people, including uh, workers. Um, so he his cap in, he wrote Capital. He was influenced by. Uh, the U.S. Civil War and the abolition of slavery. He was influenced by the Paris Commune, which again was the, the lowest uh, layers taking taking power. And he um, actually Ryadinovskaya, the founder of Marxist humanism, des described what Marx wrote about the Commune this way: the Paris Commune. It abolished the standing army and armed the people instead. It smashed to smithereens state bureaucratism, placed public affairs on a workman's salary, placed public officials on a workman's salary, and made them subject to recall. It abolished the division of labor between the legislative and the executive, and transformed the parliament from a talking to a working body. It created new conditions for labor. It stripped the fetishism off all forms of rule, economic, political, intellectual. And this is ultimately what Marx saw as the drive toward the shortening of the working day. It was not just for the sake of a shorter working day for some kind of like reformist idea. It was based on the idea that what human beings want most is to be free. And the kind of freedom that the Paris Commune had already begun was the end was what all of these shortening of the working day was striving towards. Not just a lightening of labor, but a transformation of the entire meaning of labor. That one that labor is based upon the free association of human beings, not either wage slavery or any other kind of oppressive relationship, but a cooperative relationship between human beings. Um, this, again, it's why I said I think the philosophy of May Day was written into capital. Um, the, okay, and this question of the shortening of the working day, this is something that goes deep, deep into history. And it actually goes deep into the history of May Day itself, both as it's a modern secular holiday and even as it was in ancient times a kind of pagan holiday that marked the beginning of summer. Um, in, in, for instance, in Rome, uh, it was called the Floralia, okay? the 1st of May. And it was, a, it was a more plebeian holiday than some of the others that were based in the Roman religion. Flor was not like one of the main figures. Um, but, it was based upon the idea of the new year of fertility, of creativity, of life coming back into the world. Uh, in Northern Europe, Beltane was the equivalent of this. Um, again, this was a, a holiday that was largely celebrated by peasants, by village people, not by the upper classes necessarily. Um, and it's interesting to note that you know the peasants who celebrated this did not necessarily control the, all the fruits of this fertility. I mean, they did not necessarily, they, 
had a relationship to the earth that was, you know, somewhat, they could keep some of it, but they had to turn over a lot of this, in any case, to the, the nobility. Um, but the, the holiday was, that was celebrated, it's fascinating to trace the way the suppression of that of May Day, the old May Day, and the rise of capitalism kind of coincide with each other. That uh, in the 1640s, in particular, the Puritans in England really made great efforts to outlaw May Day. It's not a coincidence that in 1649, in the English Civil War, uh, a group like the Diggers became well known for trying to fight for the right to keep the commons which were everyone's to use, the land that was every, that belonged communally to everyone. Um, it was being systematically enclosed and closed off by the upper classes, the rising upper classes, and people were being kicked off the land, being forced to wander, becoming forced to find employment, uh, being used in the, grow, the rising industries of that time um, as laborers who had no control over their own labor. They had to sell their labor power. And in 1649, um, the diggers really not only fought for the commons as a kind of thing, but they fought for the idea. And they fought for a different idea of human life. And it's very interesting to like, <coughs> look at the way they were transforming older religious ideas into modern radical ideas and revolutionary ideas. Um, but it's this idea of the commons and the common property. This is what was negated by the birth of capitalism. And it was negated in these English villages where there were you know, traditional celebrations that were now outlawed. Um, and it was outlawed, I mean, it was, it was also negated on a huge world scale by the growth of, by the conquest of the New World, by the dispossession of the Native peoples in the New World, by the, again, forcing them into mines, what Marx called the rosy dawn of capitalist production, forcing them off their lands uh, by taking the African slave labor and transmitting people to the New World and really reducing even beneath the, the level of for you know beneath the level of proletarian labor who has to sell their own labor in slavery the labor becomes a commodity himself he's not selling his labor power as a commodity the, the labor him or herself becomes the commodity um, this is, this is exactly why it the, the necessitated, before the labor movement could really talk about the shortening of the working day, why slavery had to be abolished first. Um, because that was the great weight that was holding everything down. Before that, um, before that the, the authoritarian relationship within capitalism held complete held complete sway, and in fact, in this period from like the 1300s to the 1600s, and then right up to the early 19th century, the working day kept getting longer and longer and longer by, by legislation. In, in the early day part of that period, there was an idea that, well, yeah, the working day legally is from sun, sunrise to sundown. But it was never enforced. And then it became enforced. It became the 12 hour day, the 14 hour day. It became you have half an hour for lunch. Um, you know, it, ridiculous authoritarian, oppressive um, relations. And this is, this is where May Day represents the turning of a corner historically. It represents a completely different idea of how people should live. 
of what labor should mean, how people should relate to each other, how people should relate to the natural world, in fact. Um, and this is another way that it's quite fascinating to see Marx writing a philosophy for May Day out of his own work. I mean, the, the second international, or actually the, the German the party that wrote uh, the Gotha program, had originally said, labor is the source of all wealth. And one of Marx's most ferocious criticisms of people who called themselves Marxists was over exactly this. So labor is not the source of all wealth. Nature is also a source of wealth. And this is, he said, the bourgeoisie has very good reasons for ascribing supernatural creative powers to labor. Oh, sweetheart. Because they want to use all of it. <laughs> they want to steal it all. But you can't steal it all because there's a natural life underneath it of a human being who has natural needs of a human being that have to be, that have to be developed and met. And there's a natural world that will be exhausted if you keep exploiting it. You'll destroy human society, human life, and you'll destroy the world if you keep pushing this capitalist relationship to its ultimate point. And this, to me, is like, and I, you know, I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but it brings that idea, the modern idea of May Day, all the way back, you know, to that kind of celebration of nature, but on a level that's more rational, you know, not a level where it's not just like, wow, there's fire, <laughs> you know, let's build a bonfire and like celebrate life or something, but where let's actually look at how human beings and nature fit together and what's the, what is the best way to meet human needs without destroying the natural world without having that exploitation of things to the point where, where everything is desolate, everything is dead, where the ocean is destroyed, where the land doesn't bear anything anymore, um, where the mountaintops are all ripped off to get cold, which then is going to warm the globe and destroy us. And this has all become, in my mind, um, a part of what May Day is about. And just, but you know, May Day, just to give a couple of ex uh, some examples, because I think it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And I just wanted to do a couple comparisons of this. So, there's a tale of two Chicago May Days that I've personally experienced that I want to go into, okay? One is in the early 90s, and there really was no tradition at that point of celebrating May Day. There was no, there were no big demonstrations. Those came, a few years later, people started doing those again. But at the most, people would go out to, uh, what was the cemetery in front of Waldheim. Waldheim, thank you. Well, people would go out to Waldheim Cemetery and visit and, you know, but I remember I was, at that point, I was a part of a group um, called the Baklava Autonomous Group. Oh. It was, <laughs> thank you. It was an anarchist uh, sort of thing, but you know, it had all kinds of situationist influence, some Marxist humanist influence, uh, different things. But anyway, we decided that we were going to do May Day. And what we were going to do for May Day was go to the uh, Metropolitan Correctional Center downtown and serenade <laughs> so we went down and everybody's dressed in black and you know there's like eight of us and the plaza down there if you know the metropolitan correctional center there's that little plaza where you know homeless people sleep at night and it was empty you know and we we're out there and there's two people who can play guitar and there's a bunch of us who can barely sing so we were singing the uh, the world turned upside down, the song about the diggers, you know, in 1649 to St. George's Hill, a ragged band they called the diggers came to show the people's will. They defied the landlords, they defied the laws, they were the dispossessed, reclaiming what was theirs. And, uh, you know, 
nobody was listening. <laughs> and this very large police officer came out of the place to find out what we were doing, you know. And he walked up to us and he, he said, what are you guys doing? We said, well, we're celebrating May Day. And he said, oh. And this guy, he was big. He, uh -oh. was like, he should have been Officer Roland Donut if it was like a comic strip. Um, he, and, uh, he said, May Day, huh? Uh -oh. yeah. It's not like the old days with the IWW, is it? <laughs> you know, so it was kind of, I mean, I think we had the right idea. I think what we were doing was beautiful, but it was kind of, you know, it was, it, it was interesting. It was what it meant to us. Okay, then, it was another May Day, um, 2006, which people might remember this, because there were like a million people out. This was uh, when May Day first really, really became a thing again. And it became a thing because of uh, immigrant labor and the question of, you know, um, the question of deportations, the question of, of uh, so-called illegal immigrants, all these, you know, kind of outrageous things. Um, but it was really, these are the people who were doing the work. These were, you know, the people who America would see and not notice. You know, they were the immigrant labor that would be running behind a garbage truck in Houston. Or they would be the immigrant, immigrant labor who'd be in the kitchen washing the dishes. <coughs> or they'd be the immigrant labor who was like fixing your lawn, landscaping your, your place. Uh, people saw them, but nobody paid any attention. And yet, they lived under horrific conditions of exploitation. Um, and there, at that point, there was an agreement. And there was, you know, it was a broad agreement. It, it included, you know, the church endorsed this demonstration, the Catholic Church. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of businesses endorsed it. The main unions endorsed it. And... Chicago had like a million people in the streets. I don't know how many there were. It was an astonishing. Um, it was the kind of crowd. Well, I'll tell you what, what I did that day was, because I was a homeless person at the time, so I had my hobo bag. I didn't really want to march in any parade, you know. So I, I went down to Grant Park where the rally was going to be, and I kind of put it under my head, and I ended up nodding off. I took a nap. And, you know, at that point, there's like a couple hundred people milling around. I woke up, and there were like thousands. There was a sea, an endless sea of people that was there. I mean, and there were more every, all the time coming. I'm looking down this down uh, Michigan, and there's just more and more. And they're turning. There's, people are still turning from, you know, Union Park. I mean... It was astonishing. It was the kind of crowd where time and space just cease to exist, you know. Is where you, you're not even like in the normal, the normal world anymore. It's where you're, you're walking through the crowd and you're seeing characters from literature. You know, I'm like, oh, there's Don Quixote. You know, there's Lear. You know, there's Humphrey Bogart. There's Audrey Hepburn. This is fantastic, you know. There's so many people that everybody is there. Maybe not in their in their original character, um, but that was like a whole other America appearing to itself. I think for the first time, and I think it changed the way a lot of people looked at the country. I think it was a huge change in consciousness. I think along with a few other events um, like Hurricane Katrina and a few things, it 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 changed the way people viewed this country. Um, and the angle from which people viewed it. And I don't think it's ever gone back um, to this day. I think, I think this is why there is like such a vehement reaction that's happening. Why, why the right suddenly gains so much, not new power, because they always had the power, but why they gain so much new vehemence is because they want this country not to exist this way. They don't want all of these people to be part of their country, even though they've always been part of their country. They don't want to acknowledge it. 
So I think that's the power that May Day had. You know, it, it can really change the consciousness. Um, I give you an, another example. This is a tale of two May Days this year because there are different. There were different May Days that happened this year. People saw different things, participated in different things. Uh, if you went to uh, if you went to uh, Moscow. This was the first time that they celebrated May Day in a big way since the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah, we're going to disagree a little bit here. I know, <laughs> but but you will you can come up and you can come up and abuse me later. Anyway, anyway, this was and you know the <laughs> you know and you're reminded of. You know, the old thing that used to happen under Stalinism, where the missiles would come out and the tanks would come out. And, you know, these were supposedly the people's tanks and missiles, which was, you know, kind of ridiculous, um, to say the least. But, you know, what I thought of was what are some of those people's tanks and missiles doing today? Well, they're falling on my friends in Syria. They're falling on, you know, family members and friends of people who are friends of mine, people I love, people that are important to me. Uh, they're falling on people who did nothing more than stand up for their own freedom, which is what celebrating May Day is supposed to be all about. So, you know, I I couldn't get behind that May Day. At the same time, in New York, there's a May Day celebration, and that's run by you know the unions, but also by parts of the left that are not necessarily my parts of the left. Um, and, but at, but what was fantastic is that a contingent came out that was about freeing Syria. And I thought, this is beautiful. People came out in the true spirit of May Day. Now, you could not possibly get two more divergent opinions of what May Day was about or what they were celebrating than people who are on opposite sides of revolution or counter-revolution. Um, so it's a contestation. It's a, it's a fight. You know, and I think this is why it's important, really, again, to see that there must, there has to be a philosophy to May Day that's based upon freedom, that's not based upon oppression, that has an end in sight, and that that end in sight is human freedom, human cooperation, human respect, human dignity, that a kind of love between people, not a lame kind of stupid love, but, you know, like, hey, baby. <laughs> you know, the kind of love that the civil rights movement talked about, the community of love. Um, I think that that's just necessary. Um, okay, and I, and I think, let's see, what else? Um, yeah, I mean, and there are times also that, um, I think May Day historically has had this kind of power. And I think one example of that would be 1916 in Berlin, uh, during World War I, when there was this huge slaughter happening. And Karl Liebknecht um, led the May Day demonstration as an anti-war demonstration, and, as a, and saying, we are going to actually hold true to the idea of the solidarity of the international working class. And, a fantastically powerful demonstration that really prefigured the international revolution that was going to happen in the next year, that would happen in Russia, that would happen in... Uh, Menu? No, I got one. You know, and that would not succeed, but that would happen in Germany, that would happen in uh, northern Italy, um, that would happen in <coughs> Scotland, that would, you know... And that very year, in fact, was the it's Easter Rising in Ireland. That, you know, it, was a, it prefigured a huge change um, that no, went through things like the general strike in Seattle, 
where Lenin wrote you know, his famous letter to the American working class. And there was a brief real return to international, to international solidarity among workers. Um, unfortunately, that got drowned by many things. But I think um, what's beautiful about May Day to me is that, that it can embody these things which are really profoundly philosophic and which go back to deep, deep in the roots of the culture of the world, you know, which, which can bring people in the United States, in Chicago, which can bring people together with people in South Africa, with people in St. Petersburg, with people in Bogota, that they, all, all of us, can agree on this, and it and it can, but it's a very graspable way. It's not abstract. It's a holiday, you know. It's it's a secular holiday, and it's one of the few secular holidays that really has been added to the calendar, in the same way that something like Christmas or Easter becomes part of the calendar. And if you think about it, Christmas and Easter and these other religious holidays. They, they're, in a sense, there's a similar thing. They embody ideas and concepts. You know, Christmas is like, it embodies the idea of the, you know, living God come down into the body of a human being to redeem the world. Some people think that's pretty far-fetched. I don't know <laughs> what people think here, but, you know, the, uh, the idea of May Day... It's very concrete. It embodies the idea of the solidarity of all workers aiming towards a human, humane, decent world for everybody. Um, it's it's mm -hmm. a celebration of the possibilities in life. Uh, it's a celebration of the meaning of what it is to live as a human being. And it's a huge achievement to have put that on the calendar of a large part of the human race. And I think it's worth fighting for. It's worth, I, I'm, I'm so grateful to our brothers and sisters from Latin America who brought it back to Chicago as a viable holiday. And uh, I think that we should, you know, really take seriously the idea of it having a meaning rather than just, you know, a day that we don't get off from work. That's my... And if I could just say, I would like to dedicate this talk to three Chicago ones. One is Raya Denevskaya, the founder of Marxist Humanism. One is Franklin Rosemont, who probably has spoken here at some point. Um, and one is Samantha Maddox, who has also spoken here years and years ago on black women in slavery. And they're three of my favorite people and biggest influences, and I wanted to uh, give them a shout. They're here. Yeah. Well, well, uh... All right. Uh, <laughs> starting with Jean Harker. Uh... Gee, I liked your talk so much, um, I'll say that in rebuttal, but uh, you said the unity of all people and the unity of all workers. Okay, what do we do with the police, and what do we do with the CEOs, and what do we do with the one-tenth of one percent? How do we include them, or how do you deal with them? Employ them. <laughs> should, do I, should I answer... Like right off? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I am not going to decide for everybody how to deal with them. Personally, I let them live. Um, and I think that a lot of people who are, you know, police are pretty re educable. And a lot of people who are CEOs probably could be really useful in figuring out, you know, uh, some technical details of, of what's needed. Um, the main thing that they should not be allowed to have is power over other human beings. And I think that once they've lost that, they'll probably adjust okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Bill Wentz. 
Yeah. Do you think foreign workers will ever have enough unity with American workers not to undercut American wages? Uh, well, number one, I'm not so sure that they do undercut American wages, but I, I think that they will. I do think that foreign workers will have unity with uh, American workers. I think what would ha help a lot in that regard is if uh, more of the unions would make an effort to break down those distinctions. Um, there's a real, I think, there's a real problem in general with unions. Uh, I mean, I was a I, I was a steward in a certain I'm not going to name what union it was, but um, there was a there was a, a huge effort to uh, democratize what what they call democratize the local, give us like rights to uh, elect our own stewards and and have a strike fund which we didn't have and some of these other things. And really, the dividing line there was not foreign and American workers. Here. The dividing line was white and black workers, and to some extent, Latino workers. And the whole time that the discussion was taking place within the union, never was that acknowledged that that was the problem. It, it never, nobody ever said black worker, African American worker, nothing. And yet, those were the those were the workers who were getting the real short end, and it, there were white workers who were profiting at their expense in, in terms of the union, who were getting more benefits, who were getting more protection. Um, I think that kind of thing needs to be broken down, and once that's broken down within labor's own organizations, it's going to be a lot easier to break down in society at large. That's that's my opinion. Your questions, your questions. Okay, uh, Don Ritchie. All right, I have a I have a question. Um, I, now, as I understand you correctly, when you were, you were talking about the history of May Day and how the holiday originated in Chicago, mm -hmm. you say you said that Mayor Carter Harrison of Chicago attended mm -hmm. the, the May Day mm -hmm. rally in yeah. support of the strikers. Yes, yeah. I do. Yes. Oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, watch. Well, he he actually he he actually showed certain sympathies toward them, and it was only after the the bombing that he really turned and became more he he okayed a crackdown on people. Uh, before that, he was yeah he he would you know Albert Parsons and. Carter Harrison would speak to each other. I mean, there was not a, there was not like a, it was not like Rahm Emanuel and me or something, you know. The <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you know, I've often looked at the history of uh, Haymarket and and May Day, and don't you think though that that famous poster that says mass meeting, workers arm yourselves kind of just means there's going to be trouble. I mean, you know, they, they talk about the abuse of the police. Isn't that kind of like pro provocation in its first-class sense? Well, they're just people who believe in the Second uh -huh. Amendment. Uh -huh. I've got that poster up in my office. <laughs> so, I mean, um, you, you know, you workers, know, arm yourselves. Come and take, take down your masters. Doesn't that just simply mean that they're gathering. I know it's a mass rally, a mass meeting, but don't you think that some clown's going to come and start trouble with with provocation like that? But, but it was also a defensive thing. I mean, it was they, workers had been attacked already by and and shot down and killed. I mean, right. it was not like you know it wasn't something that came out of nowhere or that right. was really adventuristic and you know and that was that was you know if. Uh, I mean, my favorite TV show was Have Gun, Will Travel. I mean, that was 19th century America. <laughs> that was the way it was. Yeah. LA Gunfighter never heard of it. We got more questions coming in. Yeah, I would, I, I mean, if, 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 if there was a situation today, I don't know that, I don't know that I would print up a poster that said, workers arm yourselves in the same way. I mean, huh. we've had, you know, 
the example I think of Martin Luther King since then. And one of the most incredibly moving things that I've ever seen, and I think one of the most moving moments in the entirety of American history, and one of the most edu educative moments in the entirety of American history, is when the uh, four little girls were bombed at the church. And Dr. King got up and he gave a speech, and the control that he showed in not calling for vengeance, and yet he didn't mince any words. He, what you saw from what he said was, in his words, he had an entire philosophy of life. And that was the idea that human society is best moved forward not by taking revenge, but by actually changing the society around you. Even if there are, and you could read it in his face, even if there are monsters who are not about to change, even if they'll fight tooth and nail to the last, that's not most people. That, and to focus only on them is like, not to fall to their level, because I think he would have not said that, but to focus only on the people who have that kind of hatred in them is to miss the bigger picture, that most human beings are educable, are changeable, and have a human heart inside them that can be appealed to. So I know that was a long answer. So, okay. so where is the revolution coming from? Mm -hmm. Below. <laughs> Where is, it, where is the revolution coming from? Well, I mean, anyone who's lived through the last few years has seen prefigurations of the revolution, I think. Um, and nobody knows where, you know, you can't predict where it's going to come from. Did, did anyone predict that a fruit vendor in Tunisia was going to be so depressed and disgusted by his condition that he would light himself on fire? And that this would translate in the minds of millions and millions of people all around the world into the idea that human life should have dignity, that we can change the world that we live in, that did anyone think that people in Madison, Wisconsin would be like saying, walk like an Egyptian as anything but a reference to a 1980s song? I don't think so. I mean, I think that you don't know where the, where the change is going to come until it happens. I mean, nobody saw that Rosa Parks was going to, you know, sit down on a bus and end up changing the face of the United States. There are just, you know, things... The, the revolution is ultimately going to come because there's a drive within human beings to be free and to have a better life and to develop ourselves in all, in all the ways that civilization theoretically makes possible, but doesn't really practically make possible. Uh, yes. Uh, well, David hasn't had a chance yet. Do you agree with the premise that Gil yeah. Scott Heron expressed in his tune that the revolution will not be televised? I, I always agree with Gil Scott Heron, no matter what he says. Yes. <laughs> Gil Scott Heron is one of my favorite people. So. Right. Yes, I... I I think that the revolution uh, will not be televised, um, except except it'll probably be seen in long distance with with lame commentary from some you know <laughs> from some bourgeois commentator who doesn't really know what the hell he's talking about. That that will be televised, but not the not the heart of the revolution. Gil Scott Heron is always right on those questions. Art Kazar has had up before. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a quick comment before I ask my question. I think the uh, poster that arm yourself, considering what capital and the government had done to workers, you know, year after year, you know, including the Ludlow massacre where they machine gun workers. I think it's a good idea to arm yourself at that time when you come to a demonstration. Because as it turned out, the cops shot everybody, including themselves, at the Haymarket uh, uh, rally. It wasn't the workers shooting the cops. Right. There were no rifle shots being fired. But uh, my question is this. Um, in Chicago, I don't know if you're aware of, there's a group called the Chicago Socialist Movement. 
It's a collection of all different left groups in Chicago, mm -hmm. and the aim is to repeat or attempt to repeat what happened in Seattle when an open socialist was elected to the Seattle City Council. So they are running a uh, candidate in the 25th Ward, I believe, who's going to be running as a socialist, mm -hmm. supported by the Socialist Party, the uh, Socialist Alternative. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many other groups. There are about you know, 10 or 15 groups that actually are working together. This is Jorge Mujica, right? Right, and I think yeah. that's a positive thing. I, I want to know what's your opinion of it. Because somebody said, when's the revolution coming? Well, you got to take small steps. And I think this is a good step. When was the last time a socialist, open socialist, not Leon Dupre? Uh, <laughs> I just was talking about somebody. Yeah. Leon Dupre was a socialist in my mind, but he didn't run as a socialist. Yeah. Same thing with Bernie Sanders. He's independent. Right. But this guy is going to run. What do you think of that? Or, or what is news and letters? Or I'm just curious what your opinion is. Well, I think Jorge Mujica is a good guy. I would actually, I would have no problem voting for him. I'm not a good guy. I mean, I don't know that. You know, it's like I was talking to a, a, a friend who's part of that campaign. And, you know, I said, you know, I think it's a great idea that you guys are doing this. Uh, if we get, you know, 500 more socialist aldermen elected, we'll be back to where the left was in 1910. But under, you know, under the conditions of reaction that we're facing now, I think it's a positive thing. And he's pushing the $15 minimum wage. Yeah, he was at the, actually he was at the May Day yeah. demonstration yes. doing both those things. Oh, sure. so, uh, All right, Larry Norman. Yeah. yeah, you talked about freedom being a major desire. How do you balance this yourself and how do you most people balance this in their mind with being secure and with being comfortable? Thank you, sir. Comfortable mostly in the economic sense. Yeah, I've seldom been comfortable in the economic sense. <laughs> I, don't, I probably don't balance it as well as some people, but um, I, yeah, I, I think that um, there's such, I mean, as we become more and more unequal as a society and as more and more people do suffer from, you know, not knowing whether they're going to have a place to live the next day, what they're going to eat, knowing for a fact that their kids will not have as good a life as the, they had. Um, I think that, you know, the, the issue of how you balance it just becomes how do you, you know, how do you break down that now? That how do you break down those incredible, I mean, I mean, unbelievable gaps between the rich and the poor that have been created? Um, I think it... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't feel like there's a huge, I don't feel a huge problem balancing it. I, I think right now the balance is so out of balance that, you know, you can't but improve it. I'm talking about the middle class, though, individuals in the middle class. Uh, you mean how would they balance it? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that the idea that a lower class would no longer be ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-fed, criminalized, uh, pushed to the margins, but that they would all, that the lower class would have everything better, I can't imagine anybody that would think that would hurt the middle class, right, you know? Okay, you're done, Richie. All right. Uh, why? May Day is like the workers' holiday in almost every country of the world, isn't it? Is that, is that yeah, a lot of them. Okay, 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 so my question is, it's a two-part question. Why did May Day become a holiday in most of the world, and, and why it, and, and why has, until quite recently, barely been observed here in this country where it started? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it, May Day has been observed here. I mean, but, it's, but, but it's not, just, not, it's, not it, like, it's, no. it's not an official, it's not a bank holiday like in England. Yeah. It's, you know, but there's, I mean, if you read, like, um, James T. Farrell, I mean, there's descriptions of huge May Day marches on the south side of Chicago in the 1930s. I mean, it, it was, there, there was a, you know, the left, as, it, as much as it existed then, really did um, observe it. But, but well, how did May Day spread to the rest of the world? Through the, through the socialist movement, essentially. Okay. It, was, it was through the, particularly the Second International, which adopted it, and in the, I think, 1910s, it spread okay. to China, and 1920s to India. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Okay, but what, 
But you said in your lecture that 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 May Day was that, that people didn't do much with May Day here in this in the United States until pretty recently. Well, that was that was I was talking about like in the eighties and nineties in yeah. particular. Um, yeah, there for a long time there wasn't a lot that was done, and and again it was came back through uh, the question, of, largely the question of immigrant labor, yeah. which brought it back. I mean, which, you know, because people in Mexico, in, et cetera, celebrate May Day, or the Day of the Chicago Martyrs. So it was, it became the focus uh, here when, you know, to raise the question of immigrant labor. <clears throat> I don't know if that makes sense, but. But that was, you know, that was again. That was like 2006. Was I think the great, great, great. Well, that point. was that was certainly the first time that I ever heard of a May Day celebration outside of the College of Complexes. Okay. Well, there have been some. There have been. Okay. Um, Dan. Yeah. Uh, you said Marx wrote about May Day in 1873 in Catholic. Yeah, what, well, the point I was trying to make, yeah, this, thank you for asking that question, because I felt like I was really getting away from that philosophy there. Um, what, I, what I was trying to say is that capital, I mean, its very structure is the philosophy of May Day, the way, some, the way like, the Gospel of Mark is the philosophy of Christmas, you know. Does, do you understand what I'm saying? The nativity and all that, right? Well, Marx, when Marx is talking about, he talks about the lengthening of the working day. He talks as the rise of capitalism. He talks about the struggle for the shortening of the working day, where that comes from. And the entirety of capital is actually structured around the idea of freely associated labor, of a different, that, that different kind of life, that different society that I was talking about. And so the whole, the pivot of the working day question is really freely associated labor. The question of primitive accumulation of capital and genocide and slavery in the new world is really that the question of, you know, overcoming that to create a new, a new kind of relation between human beings themselves. And all of that history is the history of the rise of the commodity society, which to itself seems like it's the last word. It seems like it can't be overcome because the worker is always seen as a thing. The worker is seen as a thing among other things, a, only a source of labor power, or only a source of labor. And this is the entire philosophic project of Marx, which he took from the entire history of philosophy, especially Hegel. Who, had, who based his philosophy on human freedom, but had a lot of limitations because it was bourgeois society that he was describing. So he was stuck with a lot of things like capitalism and et cetera. But this, it's this idea of freely associated labor in a different kind of society that really is the philosophy of May Day. This is the bottom of it. This is what that eight hour day struggle is all about. Is not, is workers not being slaves to their own dead labor as it's expressed in what they've created, you know, for the capitalists. So, again, I know that's a long answer. All right. I've got a question. Oh, Tim Bolger had a question. Yeah, why is, uh, what's wrong with capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> a great deal. <laughs> I don't know. Should I answer that, or should, does anyone else well, want to take that question? I'll be one idiot. I'll be the principal. Right. The principle of one idiot at a time. I'll answer the question. Um, well, what's wrong with capitalism is, first of all, where it comes from, which is the dispossession of people from the land the dispossession of people from their means of livelihood that they had when they lived in, you know, villages, the dispossession of Native Americans from this continent, which allowed for the dispoliation of their resources, the slavery of African Americans, which allowed for the building of the entire world capitalist system. I mean, the entire world capitalist system is actually built upon American slavery, 
um, or you know, not only in the United States, but in the Americas as a whole. Um, so where it came from is wrong. Where it's going is wrong, which is that it continually produces an more and more surplus people who are thrown away in prisons, who are left to starve in the third world. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, the only, I, I don't know what's, what's right about it, you know. It's a, it's, it's a pretty wrong thing. It's a, it's a thing that was wrong to begin with. Art has a second question. Sure. Well, I was going to make a comment on the question, prior question. What's wrong with capitalism? Donald Sterling. Oh. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's what capitalism can lead to. Yeah, he's, he's the a end billionaire who has nothing yeah. to lose. He, he doesn't have any worries in the world. Nothing and he finds it necessary to be a bigot against one race. Yeah. He's the end product of all the things yeah. that I just said. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, Neil. Uh, yes. David. Uh, saying that what's wrong with the capitalist system is um, uh, Donald Sterling is um, would be the same thing as saying that what's wrong with communism was um, Joseph Stalin. That's true. And that um, killing. And that communism led to the killing of 20 million Russian people, the taking of the Kulak's land, etc. Uh, I happen to be very much a pro-capitalist, and and I think everything that was said here tonight stinks. Go okay. ahead, sir. Okay. Well, Is that a question? <laughs> we'll let you know in the rebuttals. I mean, you're not completely wrong. I don't know, but the <laughs> the. Uh, Okay, first, first, I mean, if I could just go into that, because Marxist humanism it regards Stalinism in Russia as, in fact, being state capitalism. In fact, what are the characteristics of that Stalinism? It was the dispossession of people from the land. It was the, the, it, it was the dispossession of the native peoples of the Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera. All the same things that capitalism in the New World did in the early days, in the 20th century, were done under Stalinism. They were done under Maoism, too. It was the same. It was the dispossession of the peasantry. It was the super-exploitation of people in order to build industry quickly. <laughs> that was, so it, and, and it was done through the extraction of surplus labor just like was done under any other form of capitalism. I mean, and it was done with the same authoritarianism, the same kind of genocidal drive towards, you know, towards not brooking any opposition to its power. Um, so, you know, I mean, to be pro-capitalism, I mean, it's cool, but it's like, you know, own Stalinism, own Maoism. Would you say... Uh, Whoops. I have somebody behind. Ah, uh, yes, uh, Ben Roebuck. I think the whole question of right or wrong is, is irrelevant. And it's not a question of right or wrong, or good or bad, or it's because capitalism is a necessary, progressive step in the development of human society. And if you ask a rich capitalist what's wrong with capitalism, he'll say absolutely nothing. And he's absolutely right. If you ask somebody who's being exploited and beat, what's wrong with capitalism, he'll tell you his opinion. Capitalism is a progressive uh, part of our human development. But the problem is, as it gets past its progressive stage, it deteriorates. And the issue of capitalism is not right or wrong, it's a class struggle. That's what defines what capitalism is. It's not a question of right or wrong or good or bad. That's my opinion. Okay. Well, in terms of, of class struggle, I mean, all I, all I will say is, in those terms, I'm going to cast my lot with Gerard Winstonley, Nat Turner, and Crazy Horse as what I see as the progressive necessary stages in human development. And the people that they were fighting against, I inveterately think we're on the wrong side of history. 
And, and it's not a question of morality in that sense. It's just a question of, you know, who was aiming toward the better future for human beings? And Gerard Winston Lee, Nat Turner, and Crazy Horse had a much better grasp of that than, you know, the capitalists that were exploiting and murdering. Yes, uh, Ileana. Okay, very quick. So I came from system, you know, like socialism and communism. Speak up. I was came from socialism and communism regime. I mean, enough is enough. Capitalism, when people come for lack of opportunity, thanks for that. Capitalism, less of opportunity. You want to go to college, you, you want to go to work, you can go to work. You want to travel, you can travel. You can work whatever you want. It's not like socialism and communism was very strict. And capitalism, yes, land of opportunity. Yes, capitalism, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> All, right. All right, you can do it. No, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that as our capitalism becomes more and more like, uh, more and more like uh, what you saw in the old Soviet Union, I think as, as our version of capitalism becomes more and more like what you saw in the old Soviet Union with the growth of million, you know, the largest prison system in the world and greater impoverishment, I, I, you may change your mind, I don't know, or you may not. Why don't we go? I'm looking okay. around. Oh, oh yeah, it's Ellen. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment about the the great decline of the labor unions, you know, yes, especially sir. in the private sector. I mean, they're less than ten percent. It's yeah. very small, um, and the, the fact that with a you know an ideal world. Uh, Employers would treat employees well without labor unions, but it, it's pretty uncommon. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, it's pretty common that workers are taken advantage of and treated poorly without the labor unions. I thought maybe you could comment on that and whether you could think of any way to increase um, labor unions, you know, the growth of labor unions. Well, I mean, I think that to, to increase the growth of them would be to incorporate you know, more low-wage, transient workers, fast food type things. I think there's efforts along those lines. But, you know, I mean, I grew up in a time and a place which was kind of defined by the, the contract, the social contract, that, you know, there'd be union labor and there'd be factory jobs. I mean, my neighborhood was an industrial neighborhood. And it had <coughs> factories, and in the course of particularly the 1980s and Reaganism, those uh, factories closed. They moved to you know different countries, or they moved down south, and the factories stood empty for a couple of years, and then they were torn down, and then you know, Thank you, uh, you. shopping malls were built and. Minimum wage jobs replaced uh, jobs in industry at union scale. Um, the alternative economy of drugs, you know, became more common. Um, maybe talking about the South Side of Chicago. I'm not talking about it, but I could be talking about the Monongahela Valley, or I could be talking about Detroit, or I could be talking about Oakland, or any place um, where there was that social contract, and there isn't anymore. And you know, it's a, it's it's about the class struggle, and the ruling class, the capitalist class, has waged it very, you know, pretty successfully, and they've gotten rid of uh, unions uh, to an amazing extent, to an extent that I never would have expected to see. And uh, you know, it doesn't mean that class struggle has stopped, but you know, it, I think that new union, new movements will take probably different forms than the classic, you know, AFL-CIO unions did, maybe. Um, I think that, you know, people, people are going to find a way to fight back. People are fighting back. I mean, there's, you know, there are all kinds of different things happening um, under the radar, I think. But no, I don't, I don't have a prescription. 
to bring back something that I, I miss, you know. <laughs> it was like, it was nice. It was like, hey, you know, you become 18, you go down to like Central Steel and Wire and you get a job and, uh, you know, like your dad gets you in there. And it's cool. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't exist then. For me, Norman? Yeah, uh, kind of uh, a little bit of a follow up on Ellen's question. Uh, what happened down in Tennessee in your where the, uh, uh, the Volkswagen folks voted not to have a union, even, even when the company wanted them to have a union? Mm -hmm. And their brethren in Germany are paid more than twice as much per hour. So, uh, you know, I don't know enough about that. And I've read such contradictory things about it. Um, and I, <laughs> I do know that there was an argument that they were not wrong not to vote for the union, um, but I, I, uh, oh God, what, who is the, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, um, the guy who has the, wrote the book about how the Irish became white, what is his name? Ignatiev, yeah, yeah, no Ignatiev. That was his argument. Yeah. And I, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm confused. What was the argument of the, how the Irish became the guy that wrote that book? That he, he was arguing that the Volkswagen workers in that plant made the right decision or made a sensible decision or a defensible decision. I don't remember the exact formula he had not to unionize. Um, and I, you know, I just personally don't know enough about that particular thing to <coughs> count, count it, except that it's you know fairly, it's it's unfortunately it seems common that a lot of workers are voting that way. Yes, uh, Andy Anderson. I, could you give us uh, or, you know, an impression? <coughs> My question is. Uh, what's the difference, you know, we've always had capitalism in America to a certain extent. We're a capitalist society. What's different about the capitalism from the 50s and early 60s when the middle class was thriving compared to the capitalism we have now? What, what, what do you think has happened? Well, if it's all capitalism, what's changed? Uh, I think in the early 70s, where when you had the Great Recession um, of like 1974. I think capitalism never recovered from that. And since then, you've had kind of returns, like cyclical returns of you know bubbles, like technology bubbles, bank, you know investment banks and things, all of which end up crashing. Um, and I, I, I think that's not just an American thing. I think this is a worldwide thing. I mean, I think. You could trace this, as we were talking earlier, in something like the collapse of the Soviet Union, which in my view was a state capitalist part of the world, capitalist economy. Um, you know, in, in Europe, I mean, the stagnation of European economies, the growth of huge unemployment, even in places like Germany, where they are allegedly successful, but they've decided that, you know, a very high unemployment rate is what they're going to live with, which they would never have done before. Um, the complete collapse of places like Africa, where capitalism has just given up any idea that they're going to invest anything in there, um, except maybe the Chinese, you know, who are also finding that their, their own bubble may burst any day now. Um, you know, capitalism has its limitations. I mean, it gets to a certain point. And it just can't extract enough labor, enough value from the labor power of workers anymore to keep expanding. And that's, you know, I think what has been happening. And it's been happening since the 70s. I mean, I think Reaganism is a syndrome of that. And many other, a lot of other things are syndromes, including the growth of the prison system in this country, which is basically designed to take surplus labor. You know, there, there is not, a, not, there are not jobs for millions of people. And if you look at 1969, there were 100,000 people total in prison in this country. Now there's two and a half million. I mean, and there's not, it isn't that the crime rate has gotten that much higher. I mean, it's that they've had to, they've had to, they've had to figure out a way to deal with people who that capitalism just doesn't have a use for. In, in some other places, you know, people would just be killed. 
okay. in Syria. Right. For Did I give you enough okay. Wouldn't you uh, say that uh, you know the original question about the 50s and what we have now? Wouldn't you say it's really in the U.S. situation a matter of greed? Because compared to other capitalist countries, uh, our CEOs get paid way more in percentage than they do in Germany or France or Denmark. And in the 50s, we had about three times as many of the population as union labor, getting good union wages, getting retirement programs, and uh, the taxes on the wealthy were much higher than they are now. And we had a much higher standard of living. Mm -hmm. Now, the taxes on the wealthy are really low. There's hardly any union workers. And our, and our uh, average worker's income, spendable income, has not risen in 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're getting the same wages that you got 30 years ago, and now you're trying to buy the products that cost more. Yeah, I mean, it's not only that, either. It's, it's, there are things like the eight-hour day in four hours, where you're paid less. I mean, I you know, have worked at, at a UPS, for example, on loading and unloading. And you're really expected to do an eight-hour day in four hours there for very little pay, for the pay that you would get, you know, for the four hours. And you, they're trying to extract. And even at that, they're not able to maintain a, a, a standard of profitability that would match what they once had back in the 50s when they had a completely different what tiers structure when when union workers were making like, 30, you know, the equivalent of $30 an hour would be now. Yeah. And now you're making like $8 an hour, which by the time you, you know, get everything taken out, it's like $7 or whatever. It's some, some incredibly low thing. Um, but, you know, but I, but I don't think greed is the root of it. I think that this being America, though, and the politics that we've had and the politicians that we've had, particularly since Reagan, greed has become sort of a, it's an epiphenomenon. It's yes, there is like get everything that you can while the system collapses around you. But the premise is that the system is collapsing around you. It's, that it's not that it's a viable system that is just being, you know, screwed up by greed. It's that, you know, get it while you can. I think that's, that's the con man American way. That's like, you know, that's why Reagan was an actor and why, <laughs> you know, that's what was so brilliant about what he accomplished. Greed is good. Yeah, right. exactly, exactly. And that, and that was from a movie that was supposedly showing that greed isn't good. But, you know, all right. Gene Anders? Yeah, I, I want to... Uh, respond to the uh, statement you just made mm -hmm. and, and mention the question that was raised. Mm -hmm. Now, if the capitalism is working by itself and it can do this and do that without any kind of human interference, mm -hmm. then why is uh, get all I can is not greed when, <laughs> when the, the, the phrase means get all I can mean uh, uh, it's, 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 it's Built into that statement is that you're doing something that is inconsistent with certain moralities and certain truths. So, so how can you say, get all you can, but ain't nothing uh, uh, greedy about that? Well, I wasn't saying that there's nothing greedy about that. I was saying that that is greed. It's just that it's not, that's not the reason why the system is in trouble. It's just that people are using... The, the, the idea of the collapse of the system to take advantage of their own greedy impulses. But, I mean, for, for example, I mean, like, a house is on fire, you know, you can put it out, you know, you can, you can, everyone can get together and try and put it out, or somebody can run in the back door and try and loot it. And the, that's what I see as what, what, a lot of the people who are in charge of things are doing now is the house is burning down and they're running in the back door and trying to take what they can while it burns. Whereas, you know, what would be a more sensible thing is you try and put the fire out. And actually, the best thing of all would be like to build a fireproof house, you know. Well, my statement was, and if you disagree, uh, Say you disagree. Okay. To me, when you say capitalism, uh -huh. it's not like the sun or the atmosphere or natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's created by man. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. If it's created by man, it can be tampered with by man. Mm. And if he uh, 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 tampered with it, it's no longer function like the sun function without whatever you want. The sun gonna come up in the east. But when you create something, a man creates something, he can tamper with it. And we got all kinds of evidence in 2014 that human being was uh, was uh, responsible for the collapse of the uh, San Francisco back in the 90s or whatever, the, the, the meltdown that we had in the house of the financial, this 15 trillion toxic uh, toxic assets that are sitting somewhere that people is collecting money on. Mm -hmm. Now, now the, the, the assets ain't worth shit, but the money is running off the press every night. Mm -hmm. Now, I want somebody to tell me how this can be thrown aside and come up with something like, oh, oh, they uh, made a mistake. Uh, uh, they did the, these people graduated from Harvard, Yale, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, wherever else they were. Their father ran this show. And you gonna tell me they dumb and they made mistake? I'm saying, tell me what I what everybody can see that ain't you know being uh, 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 protected. In other words, they don't want to admit what the truth is. Uh, well, I'm not sure what you're asking. I'm I'm saying, do you disagree uh -huh. with the books that been written? With the Robert Wrights and, and, and yes, whoever yes, else? Yes, yes, I do. I do disagree with a premise of theirs, which is that if only these greedy behaviors would change, the system would work okay. I'm saying that capitalism at its root is fundamentally flawed, and it will always create similar problems. Now, how people deal with those problems may be different, but capitalism itself at its root, because it's based on the exploitation of human labor, will always collapse on itself every time no matter what methods are put in place to try to stop it, it will happen. It will happen as if it was a natural law. I mean, even though it's a man-created, even though it's a human-created thing, yes, and the answer to that is not to try and fix something that can't fundamentally be fixed, or to like, if we could just find who to prosecute, that would help. I mean, it might help in the short run, but ultimately, the only thing that will help is to abolish it altogether, to get rid of the system that's based on exploitation and genocide <laughs> and slavery, and to create and to and to work together with other human beings in a way that is natural to people, not in a way that's okay. We got to start destroyed. getting to rebuttals here soon. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm long. I did have, sorry. I did, can I ask my question? Um, okay. Kind of All right. Uh, look, I just, this is a, just to follow up to what you were just saying, I, I look. I don't know what what you mean by capitalism, but suppose suppose that I suppose I'm a plumber and and so I help people with their plumbing, okay? Mm -hmm. And somebody's got a leaky pipe, and I know how to do it, and most of the people on my block don't. So I come over and I help them, and 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 I just and, and I charge them a nominal fee uh, to help them out and just to make up for the cost of for the cost of time and, 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 and parts. And now uh, am I am I doing something am I committing a crime by doing that? No. Okay, now suppose I get so many people asking me to help them out that I can't do it all myself anymore. I got too many customers. And so I hire somebody else to help out to do the work and I and, 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 and I and I pay them to do this. Am I am I committing a crime? Am I am I am I committing a crime against humanity if I do that? Mm, no. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I would say no. Are you paying them their worth in labor? What their labor is getting? Are you paying them that? Or well, are you skimming off the top all right, and keeping all right, no, most no, no, of the no, no, money? Let's suppose I sit down and I say, okay, listen, let's suppose I let's, let's call the, the person Joe. And I said, Joe, listen, I know I know you're out of work right now and, and I know you need a job, but listen, I'm got I got on the other hand, I got so many customers I can't have them. Look, look, I'll hire you to work for me. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pay you $15 an hour. Is that fair? And I say, sure, that's fine. Okay. Now, if he agrees on that, if we both agree on 15 an hour, is, am, I, am I doing something wrong here? I wouldn't actually have I mean, have it could be 20 an hour, whatever it is. But if, if we both agree on, on wage that he's, he's okay with, 
Am I doing? Am I doing something wrong? Am I committing a crime against humanity? Okay, okay let's 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 let's, let's do a different hypothetical. Though. Okay. Or you're paying okay. five dollars an hour, huh? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, whatever. I I don't know. No, I mean, not whatever. You know, but okay. Say I agree with some. You find okay. Say that you find a village full of people mm -hmm. who are living fine off the land as they are, uh -huh. and you dispossess them from their land, oh. and, you, and you give them no choice but to work for you for whatever you're willing to pay them, or, to have, or they can starve, or they can just go and fend for themselves somewhere else. But anyway, you've now, like, that's, cap that's how capitalism is born. I mean, it's not born from, you know, somebody hiring a plumber's assistant or something. I mean, everyone that I've ever known does that, you know, lives that way. I mean, I grew up in the culture where that was normal. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked for my brother. Mm -hmm. I worked for my uncle, you know, and yeah, they ripped me off some, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a world system of exploitation, you know, that was just, I mean, it was just a small expression of, you know, what goes on in a much larger situation. Mm -hmm. And capitalism is what creates world wars, it's what starves whole continents, it what wipes out whole cultures, it's what, you know, it's, capitalism is a huge crime against humanity, mm -hmm. yes. And it has crimes against humanity at its root, and it's going to create more the, the longer it goes on. That's just how it, that's the nature of it. Um, but, you know, I know hiring somebody to, like, help you do something. Okay. Okay. Can I give an answer to Don on that? I got a living example. I don't know, 25 years ago or so, somebody in the newspaper went to Russia before the fall of communism, and uh, he talked to a Russian about private ownership. And the uh, Russian man said, I'm uh, free to own my own car, but I'm not free to have 200 cars and hire people to be taxi drivers and then I don't have to work. So that's the difference. That you're not supposed to live off other people's labor. Okay. Um, I would think, Brom, if you don't mind, I think it's yeah, time. I think to it's die. time for Thank our you. rebuttal period. Yeah. Let I us know think. a number of you have uh, remarks to make, but I don't know what that number is. How many people have remarks to make? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. At least eight. You didn't raise your hand then. About, well, I, I will be making remarks. Let's go about uh, All right. four minutes uh, apiece. About four minutes? Yes. Okay. Starting with Neil Rest. And I will. I have a timer here, so we're good. Yes, I've got my own. Um, uh, Tim Bolger will be making a a sign to you. Uh, Timeout sign. Uh, when you've got one minute left. Okay. Have I got the mic right? Yes, you do. Uh, before my rebuttal, I'd like to throw out a couple of answers very, very quickly. You asked about leaders. Leaders are not a problem. Followers are a problem. If some guy gets up and says, I'm the generalissimo, everybody salute, or somebody says, I'm worth $10 billion, everybody bow down, and nobody pays any attention, then it doesn't matter. Leaders aren't the problem, followers are the problem. Um, you asked over here, you asked about migrants pushing our wages down. Migrants are not pushing our wages down. The bosses are using migrants to push our wages down. Critical difference. We and the migrants have the same interests. Um, capitalism, uh, you have a two-part homework assignment. 
One is to learn about the Lawrence Bread and Roses strike, and the other is to learn about the Ludlow Massacre, where 20 women and children were incinerated because they were hiding in the trenches dug to protect them from the machine gun fire from the strike breakers because their men were dying. It was 1% of the, of the laborers killed every year in those disgusting foul mines that made John D. Rockefeller so rich. Um, this is our friend who asked about communism. The most important, most successful big lie of the 20th century is that the Soviet Union was a communist country. Um, someone asked about uh, the VW Union vote. Um, one factor was 300 million tax dollars that the big corporations got to spend fighting the union. Um, and someone else asked and ran away about the 50s and 60s. At the end of World War II, physically, there was only one industrial country in the world. Nobody else had an industrial infrastructure except the United States. And the one generation from approximately 1945 to 1973 was utterly exceptional because the United States was able to be rich enough that the workers could actually share in the wealth. And since the 70s, unfortunately, what we've had is a return to the situation that was normal from the Civil War through World War II. Now, our friend here, um, spent three quarters of an hour talking about the Haymarket anarchists without ever mentioning that they were anarchists. They were killed by the government because they were anarchists. The prosecutor, I've read the transcript, the prosecutor at the trial said, we have no evidence that these people had any responsibility for this bomb, but they talk about that kind of thing, so we'll kill them to make an example. And that is directly from the trial transcript. Karl Marx, Karl Marx destroyed the First International because he couldn't tolerate Bakunin having so much influence. He split it up and, and basically killed it. Um, when Lenin had his coup in Petrograd, the very first thing on his agenda was to attack the anarchists sooner and more viciously than he attacked the bourgeoisie. Those were his priorities. And it's interesting that um, you, you, you mentioned some of the very nice things that Marx had to say about the demands of the Paris Commune, but when the garrison at Kronstadt in, in Petrograd made almost identical demands in 1921, Trotsky's Red Army massacred them. Actually, it took two tries. The first time Trotsky sent the army in to massacre them, they said, comrades, we should talk this over, what's going on? And the troops went over to join the strikers, and then Trotsky sent in troops from far enough east. They didn't have a language in common. Um, there was... I found it, I don't have the precise citation, the Encyclopedia Britannica, a venerable source, said that the greatest single factor in Franco's victory in Spain was Stalin's treachery against the anarchists. So, okay, um, 60 seconds. Okay. Uh, Marx had the conceit he had invented what he called scientific socialism. And one of the holiest words in the Marxist lexicon is objective. Because if I say that you're objectively blah, blah, and I'm objectively right, then I've proven it. And so there, because I'm scientific. Uh, well, <laughs> that's bogus. The, what you get is a church, because there's only one truth. And anybody who deviates is a heretic and a schismatic. And the, the taxonomy of Marxist groups of various sizes and persuasions is a lot like the taxonomy of Protestant churches. Everybody's fighting everybody and arguing. But each Marxist group has the one true, only truth, and it's their duty to either co-opt, capture, or kill anybody else. And today, 
whenever there is a social struggle of any kind, you find Marxists swarming in to either take it over and take credit or to squelch it because since they're not running it, it's objectively weak. The anarchists were anarchists. Next. My name is Dan Finkelstein. Oh, no, no. Hey, what's in a name? Could be Dan Schmooze. No. Um, as far as capitalists, the speaker said capitalists, capitalism kills people, it's a disease. Well, okay, that's nice. But uh, what happened in... Uh, to Stalin, he uh, was exporting wheat out of Ukraine, and he sort of let the Ukrainians 20 million die. Uh, I don't know if, how great the, that communist Stalin was compared to the compared to the uh, evil capitalist. And also in, in China, communist China, um, uh, Mao Zedong, that great, great communist leader, when they went to Tibet, they kind of wiped out Tibet and murdered uh, many people. They changed the monasteries into prisons. They uh, took all their writing and made toilet paper out of it. And this was the, the brainy genius Chinese communists. So I don't see I don't see how the speaker can say that capitalism is bad, but communism is good. Our government is crap, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but I'm only Daniel Finkelstein. No, you're not Finkelstein. Yeah, that's my name, Finkelstein. No. All right, Daniel Schmooze, Daniel Cohen, Daniel Goldstein, Daniel Goldberg. Daniel Schmuck. Schmuck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Daniel the Clown. Call me a clown. You can call my phone number. I'll, I'll come into your party and entertain you, you also. You think I'm funny? Right? That's right. So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, of the people, by the people, should not perish from this earth. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. I'm David Travis. We uh, have people here tonight who would like to um, establish communism in America. And uh, why not? I mean, we, uh, we've we had uh, communism in... It hasn't worked in China. It hasn't worked in Cuba. It hasn't worked in Russia. It hasn't worked in South America. It hasn't worked in any of Russia's satellites. Why it should work here when it didn't work in any of those other places, I'm sure our speakers would say, well, their communism didn't work, but our communism would work. Right. So and it's Americans. like a patent to medicine salesman that says the last patent medicine salesman, his medicine was a lot of crap, but my medicine works. Well, uh, something was mentioned about we don't have to liquidate the CEOs and the capitalists. We can simply reorientate them to serve the, uh, the group, the collective. Well, don't hold your breath, pal, because you're looking at one right here that'll never be reoriented. Yeah, oh, yeah, get on that. <laughs> uh, the problem with collective societies, communist societies and so forth, is they view 
an economy as a single whole that that uh, that there are only so many slices. While under capitalism, the pie is ever expanding so that you may be poor yesterday, but today you're able to afford things. You may be broke today, but tomorrow you're, you figure out some things and you're able to make money and you have nice things. Uh, there's a, an old expression that uh, being broke is, hey, can I have some attention here, please? That being broke is a temporary condition, and being poor is a state of mind. Uh, I would uh, tend to agree with uh, Ronald Reagan, who said, that the time should come when socialism is consigned to the ash heap of history. Uh, and I'm going to conclude that the great fearless leader of the, um, of the communist... I'm going to conclude by saying that the great fearless leader of the, of the communist movement, Mr. Karl Marx, that uh, he, he actually impregnated his maid and then got uh, Angles to take the blame for it so his wife wouldn't leave him. Now this is, now that's character, man. You can take communism and you can shove it. Encore! All right! Hey! Encore! I, I, I guess I'm going to continue my uh, image as being a right-wing radical in this group, although following Dave, it's, it's going to be difficult to seem like a right-wing radical. Basically, I, I want to speak in favor of capitalism. Capitalism is not based on exploitation of labor and slavery, etc., etc., etc. It's based on innovation and uh, creativity and people taking risks and in part it is based on greed and it must be regulated. I certainly agree with that. It must be carefully regulated uh, in part by the government, in part by unions, in part uh, by competitors and, and by the marketplace and so forth. But um, the good life that we lead here today materially, even the poorest among us have a, a better life than in most parts of the world. Uh, that is based more on free markets and capitalism than on unions or government, although all, all played a role. As a matter of fact, also though, uh, Dave says we're, we're wanting to become communists. Well, in some ways we're already socialists. Uh, in fact, all major societies are, are uh, combinations of capitalism, free markets, and uh, socialism, and, and so forth. And uh, I've often said that the U.S. is one of the most successful socialist countries in the world. And that's partially because we do socialism well, but we also do uh, capitalism, and we try and balance them. They're out of balance now, I grant you. The great uh, disparities in income are ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, and we need to change that. And, and I think we will. I think there is a revolution coming, but, but we'll see. Now, I want to finish up. I don't know this gentleman's name over there who mentioned Donald Sperling. I wanted to mention that, but I didn't want to bring him up myself, so I'm glad you did, and now I can comment on it. Uh, Sperling has become somewhat Sterling. of a pariah, possibly, possibly more than he deserves. There's a couple of issues here. First of all, if he's such a racist and such a terrible person, uh, how was he picked twice by the NAACP as their man of the year? Okay. Money. Give him money. Um, money. One point. Maybe. I, I'm not quite quite so cynical about it. I think he probably did some good things. He did some bad things too. He was he was uh, known as a slumlord. Uh, pulled a lot of different things uh, in his becoming wealthy. And uh, of course, he was a lawyer, which is two strikes against him to begin with. But my my comment on this. Uh, is is uh, what about what about our right to privacy? I mean, this you know he was secretly recorded 
and and then the reporting was made public. I don't believe that if he had, and there may be lawyers who can contradict this, but I don't believe that if he had confessed to a murder during that conversation that the tape could be used. Okay, so but now it's being used to destroy him in public, and he's he's a guy who you know he's not that nice a guy in a lot of ways. Uh, but what I believe, I think it's the scumbags versus the scumbags. Uh, the NBA. Uh, didn't like him, probably because he was cheap. He was one of the cheapest owners. He didn't put a lot of money into the team. Uh, he had mostly a losing team. They didn't like that. They wanted, uh, they wanted a winner in this huge market of Los Angeles. They wanted him out. Now, whether they actually set him up by paying this woman to do this, uh, I certainly don't know. Uh, she now says, she, you know, she says he's a, he's a nice guy. She's been saying she talked to Barbara Walters at some length in the last day or two. But whether they paid her or whether when this thing came out, uh, she brought it out because she had, she was mad at him, okay, because, you know, he gave her a Ferrari and two Bentleys and something else, and maybe she wanted another one, and, and uh, uh, it wasn't going to happen. Now, Dave Ross, who I listen to on the radio uh, quite regularly, some of you may know him, had a great suggestion on this. He says, well, what about the corporate leaders that send jobs overseas? They, they let us eat poison food. They, 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 they sell us drugs that kill us rather than cure us. And, and they destroy the economy for their own benefit. Okay, uh, what about those guys? How do we deal with them? And he says, I've got a suggestion. Let's assign an angry girlfriend to each one of those guys. <laughs> Next. All of all the stuff about communism and socialism and unions and so on. I'll let that leave that com commentary for another day. Not that I've changed any either. But what I would like to do is a little prepared rebuttal on what May Day means to me. Which is basically the reason I came here tonight. Anyway, in 1969, I was being prosecuted for the draft in federal court. I found out that the judge and his father owned about a million dollars worth of bank stocks whose value had roughly doubled since the escalation in 65. And uh, I prepared a motion to disqualify him. <coughs> he turned it down, of course. I took the case to a higher court. And when the higher court had jurisdiction of the case, he issued a warrant for my arrest. And a friend of mine told me, you better watch out for this guy. He had somebody held in irons. So I wound up underground yes. for several years. Uh, the only defense I wanted to make against the draft is that it's unconstitutional. When the Fermans said raises the Fort Armies, they made a they meant a, a paid professional army. And uh, There is compulsory service, but it's under the militia clauses. It's about as unobjectionable as compulsion can be. And uh, speaking of malicious, there's a Supreme Court case in Chicago, too, for that matter. Supreme Court case from about 1878. which uh, the Supreme Court deemed it unconstitutional for private militias to be marching people up and down the street. <laughs> and those were the union heads doing that. So I know how much the times change. 
and all these right wing militias about 20 years ago. And I think basically they're responsible for the demise of the tax resistance movement. But anyway, uh, Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, nobody, nobody knows what capitalism and socialism are. It's all, it's all subjective. Okay. And they kind of the idea that you can be objective and make it into a religion. That's the uh, congruent with a theory of mind that everybody has a religion. Okay, next. Thank you, Bill Webb. Aris? Yes, I'm uh, Aris Yanabas. I'll try to be brief. And, uh, I went to four elementary schools in Chicago. I went to Austin High School, went to law school in Chicago, half a dozen colleges I took courses in. And uh, the problem is, I never learned about May Day until I learned from some Greek hillbillies down here at Lawrence and Western in a coffee house. And there's a professor here who is a hundred times more learned and educated than I am at Northeastern Illinois University. And he says, you know, Harris, I never heard about May Day originating in Chicago. I was on a train in Europe and uh, we were talking there and I said, I'm from Chicago. And he said, oh yeah. That is the Mecca of uh, May Day, the motherland of May Day. You know, the SOBs, they never told us that. And here I spent half of my life in education. And then they have all kinds of uh, everything, you know, you can say anything about communism as long as you don't say anything good. Well, I'm going to say some good things about communism. Now I didn't have the pleasure of hearing the entire lecture of this gentleman here. But communism, they say, is good in theory, but not good in practice. And I say it has been proven historically that if communism is good in theory, it's even better in practice. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the words of the greatest Sovietologist from the so uh, not Soviet Union, from Oxford University. I think his name is Robert Service. He's one of the authors authorities on Soviet, uh, uh, on communism. And on the Milt Rosenberg show, radio show a few years ago, uh, I called up at the end, you know, when they have the question and answers, and I said, I'd like to ask Professor Service one question. In what country of the 15 former Soviet republics are the people living better now that they lived under communism. And the great professor hesitated and he said, you know, he said, you know something? I'm sorry, I cannot name one where they're living better now than they lived under communism. That's all. Okay, next, Mr. Don Ritchie. Okay. All right. I, um, all right, I'm, like uh, Charlie, I'm going to be kind of eclectic and skip around, uh, as usual. Um, now, I, um, I had a couple of uh, areas where I, I disagreed with our speaker today, but it was a very good presentation. But first of all, um, first of all about the, uh, the so-called Great Recession of the 1970s. Um, what happened in the United States then? Is, uh, and there's, a, there's another scholar who's considered who's considered a leftist, who's written about this, Kim Skypes. And what happened is that you have to understand what was going on before. At the end of World War II, the United States was the only major industrial power in the world because, because the other industrial powers, Japan and, and, the, uh, and most of the European countries, had been completely devastated by the war. So our country had no competition. And for the next couple of decades or so, they were gradually rebuilding and trying to catch up with us, and we were still number one. And 
Actually, this is only Kim Skypes. I mean, actually, um, other people have written this too, uh, and have talked about this. And 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 basically, what happened is that the industry of these other places of, of Western Europe and, and also Japan finally caught up with us, and we no longer had this uncontested position. And people who grew up in that era took it for granted. They thought it would go on forever, but it didn't. It was a fluke. And however, the idea that it was that what happened afterward was a historical inevitability is, I think, mistaken. Because I, now I don't believe that anything is inevitable. I think that that what happens in the future depends on the decisions people make now. And um, in the case of the, there has been a serious decline of American industry. There's no question about it. Factories have closed, and they've moved off to places where the labor is cheaper. But that's not inevitable. That could have been prevented if uh, if we had adopted a more protectionist policy with our industry. Uh, but we didn't do that. We chose the route of, of globalization. Other countries have been tried to protect domestic Thank industry, you. like Japan, for example. And, and, and those countries that did that have remained more prosperous while, while, the, while here in the United States, poverty and, and, and inequality have gotten worse. Now, the other thing I just want to mention real briefly, if I've still got time, is I don't know whether or not Marx uh, got a girl pregnant. Uh, but but that doesn't mean he was wrong, okay? Uh, and now on the subject of Don Sterling, on the subject of Don Sterling, uh, Don Sterling got uh, awards and recognition from the NAACP because he gave them money. And it's not a bribe. They, they felt it was great that, that, it, that somebody was willing to contribute and help out so much, the, the NAACP. And of course they didn't know then that he was prejudiced. Now, finally, I just want to address one other point our speaker made, uh, just in closing. Uh, you call people in prison throwaways. They aren't. And I don't think that our society would, would consider them throwaways either if we thought about it for a minute. Now, let me just explain. Now, just, just before you go uh, scoffing at me, Brown, let me explain. Look, the prison, our prisoners make license plates. I want to show you guys. I'm glad I brought this for this T-shirt tonight. This shows how important our prisoners are. Look at this. We got two governors who, who, who help out making license plates from prison. You see how important prisoners are? They make license plates. They they, they, they grow crops. They, they they raise crops on farms. And and, and in, in my home state of Tennessee, the prisoners the prisoners um, also do road work and stuff like that on chain gangs. So you see, the prisoners are doing and. If nothing else, they provide an income to the Corrections Corporation of America. So you see that the prisoners really are an asset to our economy. They are worth a lot of money. And, and, and that's the reason, and I, I believe this is the reason why we create so many of them. Brown, you're next. Your illustration was very timely. Uh, but, <laughs> it has to do with the philosophy of, you know, Karl Marx was a philosopher. His, uh, he had a doctorate in philosophy. And the uh, subject tonight was the philosophy of revolution. Why was Karl Marx a revolutionary? Well, he spent a lot of his time and his personal fortune as an editor of the Neue Rheinische Zeitung uh, during a revolutionary period in Germany. Uh, Germany was uh, only uh, partially unified at that point under the Prussian uh, and not, not an empire at that time, the Pro Kingdom of Prussia. Uh, and the revolutionaries were well, mostly opposed to the Kingdom of Prussia, but they wanted something of the bourgeois revolution of, of uh, France uh, and uh, sort of a Napoleonic code and uh, 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 Zolverein. Uh, they wanted 
bourgeois reforms. They wanted the bourgeoisie to be uh, have have some say in the government. Uh, they wanted to be able to elect uh, or fund the election of uh, councillors and uh, legislators. Uh, and Marx was for it. He worked very hard and he spent what resources he had uh, to be a revolutionary. He was pro-capitalist in that sense, but he was also very conscious that that was not all the liberation that people needed. He saw that capitalism meant the exploitation and oppression of workers by capitalists. That they had class interests which were opposed. And therefore he said the working class, particularly the proletarian working class, that is uh, that part of the working class that didn't own uh, its tools uh, and uh, means of production, uh, were going to be super exploited and that they were therefore very strongly, at least in their interests, opposed to a capitalist ruling class. They, and if they wanted more freedom, they would have to fight the capitalist ruling class and redefine what were property rights so that you would have a right to uh, meaningful employment, a right to an education, a right to health, care and, and uh, maybe the hope of uh, a decent retirement uh, or care after you were no longer marketable. Okay. And, uh, and so he based the uh, hope of the working, the hope for freedom on the working class, and that is uh, the whole reorganization of society in a more democratic direction, okay. a more human direction, which calls for participation by people in, in uh, forums that they assemble themselves. <laughs> Time, Brahm. Like Tonight. <laughs> yes. David Sutton. First of all, with regard to the comments that were made about the Haymarket anarchists, it is now believed that the person who actually threw the bomb was an anarchist by the name of Rudolf Schnabel. Now, Mr. Schnabel was never, however, subjected to the police dragnet, and he was never put on trial for what he did. Second, when I was told this evening that among the people participating in the demonstration at the Haymarket was a group called the Anarchist Federation, I said to myself, isn't that kind of a contradiction in terms? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, with regard to the comments that were made on the subject of communism, I will simply say the following. I've told this story before uh, to this group, but I see it needs to be retold. Many years ago, there was a meeting in Moscow, and they were discussing the difference, but they were discussing the direction that the party was going to take. And somebody stood up and said, 
Mr. Chairman, what is the difference between capitalism and communism? And the chairman said, well, I'm glad, comrade, that you asked that question. It's a very good question. It's a very important question. Under capitalism, man exploits man. And under communism, it's the other way around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank our speaker tonight for uh, what sounded to me like a good rundown of the history of uh, May Day and uh, the theme that runs through all of it. Uh, it's a constant struggle. Um, history is good. Um, I don't know how many people, who's, who's got the original quote? Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, that's been used by Santayana. Yeah, George Santayana. Yeah. Martin Luther King said, there's nothing in the world more dangerous than sincere stupidity and conscientious ignorance. Um, we have all kinds of things coming down on us uh, that we might have learned a few things from history. The question I have uh, you know, what, when people had muskets or bows and arrows, uh, the idea, don't shoot until they see the whites of their eyes, uh, that meant something back then. Uh, you could still survive if you waited until you saw the whites of their eyes. If, if there's a cruise missile coming in on you, by the time you see the whites of the, uh, its eyes, you're seconds away from being vaporized. That's the way big problems are today. Uh, the climate change scientists used to be called global warming before they switched to climate change. They're divided into two roughly almost equal groups now. There's hundreds of scientists that are beginning to say, we passed the tipping point and uh, mm -hmm. if the Pentagon secret report to be believed, 70% of the human race might be gone by 2020 with the rest of it heading toward extinction by 2030 as the methane warms up, melts, and the planet just uh, warms up 10, 12 degrees in a decade or so. Uh, there's, that's one group of thought. The other group of scientists, who are in the majority right now, but it's, it's getting smaller, they're saying that what these people wrote in Climate Capitalism, if, uh, if capitalists go for the money in green technology of all kinds, we have a slim chance, but there's still a chance with something like an Apollo project or a Manhattan project, there's a chance that we could survive a major, what one author called the, the event, the sixth extinction. Um, so my talk, June 7th, will revolve around two basic numbers. I start with two numbers that it should be big red flags to anybody asking what's going on in America and what can we do. One number is 22. That's 22 veterans a day, 7,000 a year roughly, are committing suicide. The second number that you're seeing in different articles all over the internet, and they've even talked about it in mainstream press a little bit, is the number 85. 85 people have the wealth, as much wealth as the bottom half of the planet. Now that's, that's beyond the definition of economic insanity or anything else. We are, you know, we're, we're watching uh, like the, the whites of the eyes of a big cruise missile heading toward us that's going to vapor us, uh, vaporize us as a species if we don't begin to face reality and do something about it. And the reality, the facing the reality, starts with all of us down at our level uh, looking for constructive things to do. So, uh, those of you that would like a list of suggestions of what people are doing all over the world, I will have a published list out of this book and several others on June 7th. So we're going to talk about solutions, not just talk about the problems. Okay? Thank you all.
Ladies and gentlemen, what I've heard tonight is a bunch, especially with the remarks of our speaker talking about global capitalism, to me is a bunch of bunk. Here's the reason why. Take a good fundamental look at our world 300 years ago. When everybody was peasant farmers, and you had the prince who lived in the castle. It's the same thing, inequality. Now you look around, you see the CEOs living in a skyscraper, and yet your poor man is basically living in an apartment. Is that progress? I think so. As a matter of fact, just in the last 30 to 50 years, we have seen a real reduction in worldwide poverty. We have seen a worldwide reduction in a lot of common problems to mankind. Medical treatment's gone up, infant mortality rate has gone down, and this industrialist capitalistic revolution is continuing to deliver the goods. I'll even go as far to say that it's going to prevent another major worldwide power and world war. Russia is too interconnected now with the globalized world and too much reliant on free trade to go it alone and to start another major war. I don't think anybody wants it anymore. Now, as far as I'm concerned, capitalism is deliver the goods. We can see the evidence of it. I don't like exploitation. I think it's wrong when people don't make a livable wage. But there are things called antitrust legislation. There are things called unions that help workers unite to get a better wage, which is all good stuff. But to say that the system itself is corrupt, to say that the system itself is not producing the goods, and I challenge our speaker I don't think he has a fun, you know, you were saying what, what, what one of our speakers was actually giving was what the fundamental definition of capitalism was. I don't think you're against capitalism. I think what you're against is exploitation. I think what you're against is what everybody's against, and that's unfairness, exploitation, usury. Yeah, I think we can agree on that. But as far as our economic system's concerned, it's delivered the goods. Okay, hi, my name is Ellen, and um, I just had a few comments um, about um, even though I'm not particularly knowledge about the subject of anarchy, I wanted to share with you guys, um, I was listening to a lecture um, the other day by the man who wrote the book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Does anybody know who wrote that? Um, <laughs> so what he's arguing is not, uh, the book is called The Better Angels of Our Nature. He's not arguing that humans have suddenly become better people, um, that human nature has radically changed or anything like that. Um, what he's arguing is that um, he's... Did his, he's claiming that he did a, an exhaustive study of prehistory and the, the murder rates and, and the death from violence rates were extremely higher, extremely significantly higher. I think it was like over 500 per 100,000, um, if I'm remem remembering correctly. Um, and then he's talking about in today's society with um, what some people call primitive cultures, um, what a lot of people, what better ways um, you can call them traditional societies, that there's a, a vast range in the violence rate, 
but um, you know, with some very, very low violence rates and some very, very high violence rates. Um, but still, um, if you average them out together, the violence rates are, are very, are still, they're not as high as I think prehistory, but they're, they're very significantly higher. The murder rates are very significantly higher than, say, he was comparing it to the, to the 20th century with the world wars and all the endless violence and, and genocide. Um, so, and I, I think one of the things he's arguing is that, you know, government, I mean, government, you have to have, you know, unless you have, I, I don't know, from the way I see it, unless you have a very small band of people, like up to 120, 150, I don't see how you can have the social controls um, that will prevent people from being very violent toward one another. I mean, um, if you, you know, I mean, it, you know, let's, if you have like a nuclear family, um, well, there's really no police over there, um, but, you know, there, there um, you know, that's a very, very small group of people, and, and you can exert some social control, and then if the, the parents get angry at the kids, they might be able to kick them out if they're of, certain, of a certain age. We're sent out to boot camp. Um, so um, so I, I, I think that government does play a role, and I, and I think as Ernie was talking about, you know, I, I mean, I, I am for a capitalist system. I think there does need to be a lot of socialism in it like there is, but I think there should be more. I think there, sh there needs to be universal health care. I think that should be a right. Um, and, um, the, you know, and, and, uh, and pertaining to the issue that we were talking about today, um, you have, you, you giving me the time signal, uh, Tim? Okay, um, just real quick. Um, you know, I think that the decline of labor unions is extremely problematic. Um, I've worked quite a few jobs, and I don't believe that I've ever been a member of a union. And um, I think, you know, there's no control on employers. There's, there's okay. little control on them to treat their workers well, and they very frequently don't. Um, so, okay, thank you. Speaker gets the last word. Our speaker, Brad Mecklenburg. Well, thank you. That was interesting. Um, I will say, I, I, you know, I have a lot that I want to say. I mean, so you come to the College of Complexes, you know that you're going to get some interesting discussion. You know you're going to get some great rebuttals, you know, uh, that's, that's part of being, that's part of being a social human being, right? So I have no complaints about most everything that I've heard. One thing I'm going to complain about and rebut the rebuttals. The food. And then, <laughs> no, the food was low and the service was fantastically great. Hey, Susan. I love her here. Yeah. She was magnificent. She was magnificent. No, the... But the thing that I'm going to rebut is the parts where people weren't listening to me. And that is, I really never said anything nice about Stalin. In fact, I basically said that he was a genocidal murderer and an exploiter. I never said anything nice about Mao or Maoism. I basically said that, that he was a genocidal murderer and an exploiter. I'm not sure where that came from. That was made up um, by people who forgot to do this, so please get with the slogan next time, you guys. Um, and, the other, and the other thing that I will say is, yes, I think that that was a point about the Haymarket people. I mean, no, I did the Haymarket, no, I'm getting to that. I did say, I did mention anarchists, and I'm happy to say that they were anarchists. That's not a problem. I think it's also not a problem to say yes. Marx did have a kid with, you know, the woman who was his maid, who was no. a, who was a comrade. No. It did happen. I mean, no. you know, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I actually wrote an article about it in News and Letters, I, which mentioned it. So I clearly don't have a problem with it. I'm not sure why it's presented as a problem. Um, but the thing that, the idea that Bakunin somehow should have controlled the First International, I think is completely crazy. Since if you look at what Bakunin did after that, what Bakunin did was come up with, he basically invented the theory of the Zog. He said, well, there's Marx, the Jew, and there's the Rothschilds, the banker Jews. And it's a Jewish conspiracy to control the world. And I think that only an insane person would suggest that that man, Bakunin, should have been ahead of any labor movement or movement for human freedom. That's, I think that he was completely no one said that. wrong. Ah, uh, hey, somebody might have. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Yes. I hope that you all return to class promptly. We'll be meeting next week, same time, same place. Same bat time, same bat channel. Somebody's playing the poop man. Must be a poop man.